In 2003, punk rock band The Distillers put out this record here, Coral Fang. But this was not the original cover. This is the safe cover. But this story doesn't start in 2003. This story starts in 1995 with our girl Brody Dahl in Melbourne, Australia at some Catholic school, okay? As a child, her friend's dad, their neighbor, essayed both Brody Dahl and the friend. So we got this 15-year-old troubled youth named Brody Dahl down there in Australia being a punk rock kid, okay? Skipping class, doing drugs, being a punk rocker, starting a little band, okay, called Sourpuss, then dropping out of school, and then playing this festival over here called Somersault. Now, this was just days before her 16th birthday, and she was 15 years old when she had the opportunity to play this festival. This was the festival in which she met Tim Armstrong, front person and guitar player for Rancid. Hey, how's it going? I'm your friendly neighborhood gatekeeper, Dan Frampton, and that's right. Today, we're taking a look at the distillers. In particular, the early days to see if what they did was indeed sell out when they put out Coral Fang. So it was at that Somersault Festival when Brody Dahl was less than 16 years old where she met Tim Armstrong. They started to have this like mutual connection or whatever and they knew that there was a connection there but nothing really super weird was happening yet. But when you look back on it in retrospect it was already super weird because Tim was famously 30. But they started communicating back and forth after the festival and they would talk into the late hours at night and just like really romanticize one another from afar. So a couple years go by and then Tim is like, hey Brody, how's about you move on over here to LA? And that's what she does. She ends up at LAX and starts to realize she's not in Kansas anymore and that Rancid is kind of run like a mafia, a very sober and clean mafia. And keep in mind, this is Brody doll. She is the farthest thing from clean. She's the second coming of Courtney Love in habit and in sound. And now she's falling so in love with Tim Armstrong and that whole thing that she starts to embody all of his mannerisms. So she's bouncing around aimlessly in California for a bit. She's like, I gotta do something. So she has this brilliant idea to start a band. So she starts The Distillers. And by then she's married to Tim and has taken his last name. So no longer is she Brody Doll, she's Brody Armstrong, and the Distillers record is gonna stay in the family just like the way Rancid likes it, and they're gonna put it out on Hellcat Records. But as they're ramping up to put out this Distillers record, the compilation that this label does is called Give Em The Boot, and they started to test the waters by putting Distillers tracks on these compilations. And then it happened, they put out their debut LP, and it's just like girl Rancid. She sounds exactly like Tim Armstrong, gurgling and mumbling her way through lyrics. Well, she kind of sounds like a love child between Courtney Love and Tim Armstrong, if I'm being honest. She's really wearing her influences on her sleeve, and yeah, that might be a little bit cringe, but this record is pretty good, even to today's standards. But there was a review by Frank Kogan in The Village Voice that really resonated with Brody. Now, it wasn't a scathing review. He was actually pretty positive about the record. He was just like, you know what? It's a little bit too Joe Strummery. It might be a little bit too Courtney Love. You know what I mean? But I can't understand a goddamn word that this lady is saying what the hell is she saying and then when Brody reflected upon that she was like you know what I don't really know what I'm saying I'm just kind of like mumbling and gargling my way through songs so that really resonated with her in a way where she was like okay I got to be more serious about my songwriting and that more serious approach to songwriting would really show itself on this record over here sing sing death house by the time Brody and company are putting out this record the rest of her band are not really falling in line okay because this is basically the Brody doll experience and the other members of the band were like no we want we want to say in this and then Brody's like that's not gonna work for me brother you know pulls a whole Hulk Hogan over here but then she recruits a whole new band and in particular I got to mention the drummer he was a big fella named Andy Granali and he would basically be Brody's muscle in interviews and stuff. If interviewers started to try to cross the line, Andy was going to be like, Haha, listen bud, those aren't the questions we're asking right now. And it was around this time where the distillers are getting super hot. They are moving and shaking, and by the time that they're really making these waves, Shirley Manson of the band Garbage starts to kind of be a mother figure to Brody Doll. So much so that they end up rubbing elbows with sister label to Warner, Sire. And when they're doing all this sort of stuff, Tim is just back home being jealous, okay? Now keep in mind that this guy is like 
35, 36 years old. Brody's maybe 20 right now. So much is weird. I did a whole video about that whole relationship and about how weird and toxic that thing is. So that's not what this video is about. But, so just imagine, you got like this 35 year old punk rocker at home, just sulking, being sad. Brody comes home from just like rocking the world, you know what I mean? And he's like, I miss you, babe. Oh, just come back and join the mafioso over here. And she's like, no. You're, what do you mean you miss me? You're a big old man. Go do go go do big old man punk rocker things. You're also Tim Armstrong. I'm 20 years old, living it up, okay? I'm going to sign to Warner. So, that's what she does. And meanwhile, she doesn't know that Rancid is also working on a deal with Warner. But we'll get back to that in a second. So the distillers are off being the distillers and Rancid hit the studio to record Indestructible. It's halfway through the recording of this record where Brody Dahl calls Tim Armstrong and is like, yo, I don't want to be, I don't want to be Brody Armstrong anymore. I'm divorcing you. You suck. I hate you. Go away. And when that happens, it shatters the world of Rancid. Everybody just wants to be there for Tim, wants to be there for their friend. They stop recording the record, Tim goes home. But how does Tim process this? By writing songs. So they're not away from the studio for too long before they're calling up Brett Gerwitz again and being like, okay, we're coming back to the studio, buddy. We have a bunch more songs. So that's what they do. There's a couple songs that are very clearly about Brody on this record, but I just want to mention Ghost Band because he's basically calling Brody Doll a clone, a copycat of him, and that there's a, a ghost band playing their songs. So in my mind, that's kind of like a scathing diss track as well. You love to see that kind of drama amongst a divorce, but it is this time where Brody is just like gallivanting around. She ends up finding Josh Homme over here, the lead singer of Queens of the Stone Age. And there's this famous picture over here of the two kissing that sends Tim into a spiral. And now Brody and her band are enemy number one in the scene. They're not welcome anywhere, okay? They can't be seen with anybody else for fear of the scene rejecting them, okay? Everybody hated Brody at this time. She was like America's most hated woman and even made a whole tour called that to tour off the back of this kind of reputation. That is marketing savvy right there. But there was an evening at CBGB's where she like kicked a fan in the head. So there's that whole incident. She might have taken it a little bit too personal, but how could you not, okay? It was getting pretty heated, pretty dramatic, but I say you don't, you don't kick people in the head. You don't kick fans in the head no matter what they do. You have security to do that kind of thing. Don't pull a Sonny Singh out here. So remember how I wanted to say uh, there was a whole Warner thing on the back burner here? Yeah, Rancid was also going to put a record out under Warner, but they made it so confusing, okay? They didn't want to have the Warner label on the record because then the punk fans would be like, you sold out. You're Rancid. Of any band in the world that's to sell out, it can't be Rancid. So they didn't want the Warner label on the record, but as far as Warner was concerned, they were a Warner band. So as you could imagine, this was the time that most punk rock fans kind of stopped paying a lot of attention to the whole rancid Brody doll thing because there was no more feet in the punk scene. These were Warner label bands. This was the mainstream stuff. This was tabloid gossip by this point. So much so that in one of the music videos for one of the songs that came off of Indestructible, they had Kelly Osbourne in it. So we had Kelly Osbourne rubbing shoulders, okay, with the rancid crew. This is what Kelly Osbourne looked like back then. She's Ozzy Osbourne's daughter. She was one of like the stars of the Osbournes at MTV show. But if you want to see what Kelly Osbourne looks like right now, you wouldn't even say it's the same person. So that brings us to 2003, where this record that started off this video, Coral Fang, comes out. Now this thing comes out on Warner and also Indestructible by Rancid is coming out on Warner one week apart from one another, kind of riding parallel trains. You know this drama was gonna continue on from the punk scene into the mainstream culture. And like I was saying, this is the safe cover. The original cover has a naked lady crucified just bleeding razor blades, okay? So that's not the kind of thing I can show here on YouTube, and it certainly wasn't the kind of thing that they could have at Walmart, okay? So the reason why they had to change it is because what if somebody's living in a small town where Walmart is the only place to buy CDs? Now I know in the, the year 2023, that sentence, buy CDs, might not be something that makes sense to you, but back in the day, you used to have to go to a store and pay actual money to listen to the music from artists that you like. In order to get onto those shelves, they had to make a couple compromises along the way. And if you can't tell, this is kind of like a sarcastic, overly safe cover. They're like, oh, you want a safe cover? We're gonna write safe cover on it, and we're just gonna put a whole bunch of cute animals on it. But the label was just like, okay, fine, <laughs> whatever. But it was at this point, 
her heavy, Andy Grinali, the guy that would be like, don't talk about Tim right now in this interview. That guy, he started playing drums for another band behind Brody's back. Now, instead of talking to Brody about it, he was just like, oh no, my, my, my finances don't make sense because I spent all my money doing drugs and stuff. And, and, and then I wasn't like, oh my God, I'm so, I'm so stressed out. Where was my accountant? Oh my God, I'm so fucked up. I was such a fucked up rock star. Anyway, in that headspace, he's like, okay, I'm just going to start another band. So he starts this band, Darker My Love, and it breaks Brody's heart. But by this point, Brody is like over it. She is the most hated person in like the entire music scene and then she puts out her worst record ever under the name Spinneret. the label doesn't even like it they're just like okay brody just take this stuff and do whatever you want with it we don't want it anymore and that's where we're going to leave this story off but was this a sellout did the distillers sell out by putting out coral fang i say Brody sold out the day she like dropped out of school. She was just doing whatever she could to be in the mold, to be in whatever group she wanted to be in along the way. She's like, oh, you want me to be a punk rocker? I could be a punk rocker. And she was so heavily addicted to drugs that by the time she was in a scene that was sober, she had to stop the drugs cold turkey. It takes a very kind of malleable person to kind of do that because people that are addicted to drugs, you know, it's a hard thing to, to, to live with and to give up. But what's more important than that? Social standing, you know what I mean? And I think that's a good idea to, to quit doing drugs and to be sober, so that's a great choice. But the moment that they left that mafioso sober living camp of Rancid, they went hard back on the drugs. So my point is, I don't think that Brody's ever been really an authentic, real, genuine type person. Yeah, she was kind of cool, and yeah, she was kind of like this like femme fatale rock star badass, for sure, absolutely. But I think it was more of an act. But that act is rooted in childhood trauma. And that childhood trauma manifested itself in teenage grooming. So how do you expect a person to turn out that lived like that? And she was married to that Queens of the Stone Age fella for a very long old time. They got a divorce last year or something. So that drama is still continuing even into the current era. But yeah, that was the penultimate sellout video. I have one more after this. So please turn on those post notifications so you're notified when I drop it. But until my next upload, watch another upload.